that's fine. Don't worry about it, Larry. Okay. I do. Um, I'm Jerry Dallas. I'm going to let Deb Asma take over. She is going to facilitate our meeting tonight. Well, welcome everyone. First of all, we would like to read our mission statement at the beginning of every meeting just to remind ourselves what we're here for. The Smurfit Stone Millside Cave Advisory Group to serve as a trusted liaison between the community, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality by becoming informed, sharing this information with the public, and engaging in the Superfund process to ensure the restoration of the former Smurfit Stone Mill site to a healthy ecological state for future generations. So we, we'd like it to be an inclusive conversation. We'll do our best to include all comments if you have to move things along, we we'll invite you to help us make that decision if we're going to move along or if we're going to stop things to get to more in We do have a packed agenda. First thing on our agenda is introductions. I'm Deb Kafka. I work at the Watershed Education Network in Missoula, and I'm interested in all the information about this. Uh, Brian Sanchez, EPA. Larry Deers with Pacific Western Technologies. John DeArmond with the Clark Fork Coalition. Larry Shadow, Richmond River. I'm Shannon Terrio, uh, Director of Environmental Health for the Missoula City County Health Department. I'm Stan Lucian, I'm just a four farmer resident living in Hawaii. We're glad you're here. Somebody's got to watch you. <laughs> I'm Jerry Gillis, um, part of the CAG admin team and uh, French Town resident. I'm Bruce Sims, though. I've also been volunteered to be part of the CAG admin team, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the Who's I'm resident. Uh, Betty Olison, uh, keyboard operator. <laughs> <laughs> much, much that. My name is Travis Ross. I'm with the Missoula Valley Water Quality District. My name is Danielle Tribble, and I'm the Western Montana Field Representative for U.S. Senator Steve Gates. I'm Jen Harrington. I'm part of the admin team for the King. I'm Connie Garrett. I work with the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm not on the agenda, Deb, but I just wanted to say after the meeting, if anybody has any specific health concerns, I'm having my scoping meeting with, with our, our funding agency. And so I don't have any information on that. If anybody has some, I would appreciate it. Uh, my name is Derek Goble. I'm with New Fields. Karen Miske, Frenchtown resident. And I'm Matt Garrett. I'm a, just a retired citizen. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm also from Superior. I'm a resident from there, so we're down there. That's oh. wonderful. The next thing on the agenda is review of the minutes from the August 2nd meeting. We just approved. Yeah. Does anyone have any additions or edits for the August 2nd? Minutes. Thank you again, Betty, for your detailed notes. You did such a great job, and we really appreciate the, the detail that's provided. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we'll, I think we'll accept those minutes and move to any public comment on non agenda items. Item. Yeah, if you have a non-agenda item, you may comment on. Yes, um, this is not in the agenda. Um, EPA uh, Service Parks has asked our company to prepare the community involvement plan that Robin Bowler had left off um, unfinished, and so we took his information and we're compiling it into the actual community involvement plan, um, and we should have it uh, to present to the CAG in the October meeting. It's our, it's our plan to do that. Um, <laughs> It does still have to go through review of EPA, and it won't be final when it goes to you guys, to the CAG, 
it will be a, uh, a working document that we will um, likely uh, change as, as things change in the community and, and information changes, resources change, and, and we're hoping to use it as a reference uh, and that, that somebody that has no idea what's going on at the site can pick up this book and at least get a pretty good understanding of, if not what's going on out there, who to talk to to find out what's going on and other resources and such. So I just want to put that out there as a non-agenda item. Okay. And the only other non-agenda item I have, if you're new to the meeting, all the records are kept here at the firehouse, hard copy in a box around the corner by the fire chief. You're welcome to come read and learn all you want. Looks like we're to site testing update by Ryan Hancheck. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, of course. Um, so my name is Brian Sanchez. I work for EPA. I'm in the uh, Region 8 office in Denver. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, some of the uh, sampling activities that have been going on uh, around the Smith and Stone site. Um, I'll be talking specifically about the uh, Rainbow Trout and Urban Pike sampling uh, program that took place from July 2nd to July 17th. Um, this work uh, was done and is continuing to be done uh, by EPA in, par in a partnership and cooperation with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Uh, so the <clears throat> objectives of this, of this investigation were to, first of all, determine contamination levels in um, northern pike and rainbow trout in the Clark Fork River, the Bitterroot, and the Blackfoot Rivers. Um, in particular, um, we're talking about coplanar PCBs that have dioxin-like activity and also the uh, also dioxins and furans. Uh, this data will then um, be useful for the human health risk assessment in order to determine if levels in these fish uh, might pose an unacceptable risk to humans that are consuming fish from this system. Uh, the data will also be useful and used in the baseline ecological risk assessment. It'll give us a better um, estimate of exposure levels um, to, our, um, to our ecological receptors uh, that are consuming these fish. The data should also be useful to Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. As you all are, are aware, there is a, a fish consumption advisory on the Clark Fork River uh, that was based on a relatively small data set. Um, this data set um, is um, wider ranging geographically, and there are more samples. So it's, uh, it's a better data set, and I think it'll be useful by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, in that sense to determine the, um, the validity of the advisory, potentially remove it. It's just more data, so I think it's good in that sense. Um, and potentially it may help us to determine if contamination levels in fish, anything that we do detect, is possibly tied to Smurfit. Um, whether that can be done or not, that's a difficult ask, but um, we, we will uh, see if that's possible. This is a quick overview of the sampling program. Um, again, we targeted uh, rainbow trout and northern pike um, in the Clark Fork, Bitterroot, and Blackfoot rivers. Uh, there were eight total sampling reaches that were targeted. There were seven for rainbow trout um, that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, targeted uh, for a collection of rainbow trout and two for northern pike. Um, again, we wanted to quantify uh, the coplanar PCBs and dioxins and furans. Um, and one thing that we did with, with the sampling program and why this data set I think will be extremely useful is that um, fillets were removed from each of the fish uh, with the skin on and belly flap attached. Um, and then we also, we separated that part and then we used the whole body remainder and we'll quantify, P we'll quantify um, coplanar PCBs and dioxins and furans in both, in both portions. So we'll have in, um, uh, levels of contamination in the fillets, we'll have the whole, ba whole body remainder where we can get an estimate for whole body concentrations. So that makes it really useful for um, a variety of human health um, exposure scenarios and also for use in the baseline ecological risk assessment. So our e ecological receptors aren't necessarily picky. They're not eating just the fillet. They'll eat the whole fish um, or as much of that um, as they can consume. So it's a really useful data set. It should be. Uh, so a rainbow trout sampling approach. These are the seven reaches. Um, five on the Clark Fork, one on the Bitterroot, one on the Blackfoot. So our furthest downstream location was at St. Regis. This is approximately 45 to 50 river miles downstream of the site. Um, we have a, a reach, which we call the French Town Reach. This is immediately downstream of the Smurfit Stone uh, site. We have a Council Grove Reach, which is uh, near Council Grove State Park, uh, downstream of Missoula. 
uh, Missoula Reach, which is more or less within the boundaries of the city of Missoula, and the Clinton Reach on the Clark Fork. And this is the furthest upstream that we went on the Clark Fork. Uh, we also sampled the Florence Reach near Florence on the Bitterroot and the Greeno Reach um, on the Blackfoot. Now these um, last three, the Clinton, Florence, and Greeno, are approximately 30 to 35 river miles upstream of the Smurfit Stone site. For our northern pike, uh, we only had uh, two reaches that were targeted. Uh, consultation with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, it was our suggestion that these were the only two areas um, in this broader geographical um, area that uh, we could collect the target number of fish. So um, we collected or we targeted Fish, Wildlife, and Parks targeted uh, Northern Pike in the Frenchtown Reach and also in a low, low reach near low, low. Um, I should say that, um, I haven't said it, it's been on these slides, but that we targeted approximately 20 fish in each of these reach, 20 rainbow trout, 20 northern pike, and we composited um, five of those fish. So we had four composites of five fish, five fillets and five whole body remainders from each of these sites. That was our goal. Uh, this is a map of our uh, reaches. Uh, the Smurfit Stone site's approximately right there. Missoula's right in here. So as you can see, um, moving downstream to up upstream, St. Regis here, Frenchtown, Council Grove, Missoula, and then Clinton. And here's Greeno, uh, Lolo, where uh, Northern Pike were targeted, and the French, uh, the uh, Florence Reach, uh, where Rainbow Trout were targeted. Um, and this is what was collected. Um, as you can see, for the majority of the sites, um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks met. Um, the objective of collecting uh, four composites of five fish each. There were some locations where that wasn't possible. This uh, sampling took place even when it started later than Fish, Wildlife, and Parks would have liked to have done it. They like to, con to finish up this type of work by July 1st. We started on July 2nd. So when they were hitting some of these sites later on into mid-July, the river was coming down, clarity was increasing, it just wasn't ideal for collecting fish. But they made a good effort. I'm pretty happy with with what was collected. So these are for our rainbow trout. For our northern pike, um, they did get the target number of composites and fish from the two northern pike reaches. Um, they also collected these uh, sort of bonus uh, composites um, from Missoula and Council Grove. So they collected those. We think that there is some value to analyzing those fish. Um, uh, we didn't intend to collect them, but they're opportunistic samples and they are, they're valuable. So that's kind of what I have. I don't have any data to show you right now, um, but I wanted to kind of give you an update on how that program went. Our next steps um, and sort of step zero on this thing was getting the fish from Missoula to the Denver area, which proved to be a bit difficult because there were a lot of fish in several coolers, but that's been accomplished. Uh, the fish are, are happy now. They're um, in Lakewood in a freezer, um, but they are maybe not so happy, but they're in good hands. Um, so that's been accomplished. Um, next step is to process the samples. Uh, so the uh, fish are now with ESAT. This is a contractor to EPA in the Denver area. ESAT is going to process the samples. And this is really just homogenizing these fish, grinding them up, um, putting together proper aliquots that can then be sent off to, to the laboratory for analysis. Um, and when that um, processing is done, the samples then get shipped off to a, a lab within the Contracting Laboratory Program, or CLP. Uh, we don't know quite what lab is going to run these yet. Um, that program operates, um, so, so when the samples are ready to get sent out, they'll figure out what lab has the capacity to analyze them, turn them around fairly quickly, and they'll go to that lab. Um, and then we'll receive uh, the data and try to interpret it and make some sense of it. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. We haven't started processing the samples. Um, in the last week or two, we've realized, or it's come to our attention, that there were some deviations from the sampling and analysis plan. So we're trying to figure out what that means and where to go from here and how to deal with those deviations. Um, but um, yeah, we're uh, committed to using and producing um, highest quality data, the most defensible data, um, and data that we are confident in. Um, this data will be used to make um, decisions, and if they're going to be good decisions, we want good data to go into that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I have. Yeah. <clears throat> what, do you have a rough idea on time frame? Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I skipped. <laughs> um, so when we do move ahead with processing the fish, um, it sounds like it will take ESAT about four weeks um, 
to get the fish ground up and composited correctly. Uh, once CLP has the samples, they can turn it around, turn them around, um, and get us data in three weeks. And so that's from July, from when? Yeah. So right now, the fish again, they're in a freezer um, in Lakewood. Um, so we haven't started the processing yet. Once processing begins, that takes four weeks. Um, once the lab receives the samples, they can turn them around in three weeks. So is the um, the do not the fish order going to be tied obviously to this or not? Um, I don't know if you want to answer that, but it'll provide more information for fish, wildlife, and parks to use to determine how to deal with that. So, sure. Can you explain more why you chose the why composite sampling was used for the fish? Um, you can look at average concentrations in a larger number of fish. And the fish that were composited or are going to be composited are of a similar size. So they're typically, they should be of a similar age and should have similar contamination levels. So I think a compositing approach in this sense was OK. Um, and we took four composites from each location. So we'll get some estimate of variation from each of those reaches. So I apologize if I'm kind of uh, bringing things up that have already been discussed. But I have a couple questions. So the sample size, based on what I, I saw, was a total of 50 fish. Is that correct? Uh, more, more or less, I guess. It may be more like 60 um, individual fish or composites. Well, 60 to 50 or 60 total. Um, no, it would be 36 times four. Because there's four fish in each composite, and there are 36 composites. <coughs> five fish in each composite. Five fish no, in each composite. No, I thought there was five. Yeah, I thought there were five. Five, right, okay. So we have, ideally, we would have collected 20 fish from each reach. So what would that be? 20 times seven reaches for the rainbow trout. So that's 140 five rainbow trout, trout, and that would be 40 northern pike. Um, and then we collected a few more northern pike um, in two locations. OK, and then my next question was, in terms of the species of fish that you selected, are these the most sensitive to these particular contaminants? Yeah, so northern pike in particular, I think, are, are a good species to look at. They're long-lived, they're predatory, so they're at the top of the food chain. So it's likely that they have the highest levels of these particular contaminants in them. So it gives us an idea of a worst-case scenario out there. Okay. Um, and then how do you tie that to the impacts on the food, up the food chain in particular? Um, well, um, for our ecological receptors, um, if we have estimates of whole body concentrations of these contaminants, you know how much, say, a river otter eats every day. Um, so you can estimate their ingestion of these contaminants from fish. You also tie in ingestion of sediments and water, and you can get an overall estimation of what they're ingesting. And then you can tie that to some toxicity benchmark. So, so that won't be done with sampling. That would be done more with modeling, essentially. Uh, yeah, I mean through uptake model. Okay. Go ahead. But, but there are other samples that are collected to help with that ecological yes. risk assessment, yes. including small body fishes, long nose days, as well as peptic macrovertebrates, right. sediment samples as well. So okay. it's not just, it's not just, okay. just, not, not just these yeah. fishes. Yeah, that, thanks for clearing that up. Um, and that's sort of what Addendum 9 tried to get at, was trying to fill a lot of those data gaps so that we can do this uptake modeling exercise. Okay, final question. And then how do you tie this back to <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, these things, um, as I'm sure everyone in here is aware, uh, are fairly ubiquitous. Uh, it's hard to tie them to one site or to one source um, because all of our vehicles emit these things. Um, burning wood emits these things. Um, it's difficult. <coughs> we collected fish downstream and upstream of the site. Um, so we are interested in looking at relative concentrations geographically and seeing if that will indicate something about where they're, where they're um, what the source is. Um, I don't know how definitive that will be, but that kind of went into how we chose these locations downstream and upstream. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. One, one thing to add to that, too, is um, I mean, that, that's something that's been a big, big issue, the sample locations with the trustees, uh, and as well as working uh, with EPA. And we really wanted to to accurately categorize or quantify you know, what the background levels are in the environment versus what might be related to the site. 
this is just this study is just one of hopefully many to assemble you know multiple lines of evidence that might help understand that question. You can't, yeah, it's it's very complicated. No, I appreciate issue. that. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Great discussion. Any more questions or comments? We're going to talk about the sound of deviation. So that's something we explain. Um, yeah, we're still trying to figure out how to deal with that. I'm not ready to really elaborate on that too much right now. Yeah. Could you repeat the question for the... Sure. The uh, deviations from the sampling and analysis plan. Um, she asked if I could elaborate on that. Um, we're still trying to figure that out internally. Um, and we haven't come to any conclusions. So um, I'm not ready to talk about that, if that's OK. Sure. I'm sorry if I missed this through your time. You said it would take four weeks to process, or four weeks to process the samples and three weeks to do the analysis. That's right. Once they leave the freezers. Did you say when they're leaving the freezers? No, that's what we're trying to figure out in terms of how to deal with the... the oh, because of this problem. Yes. Uh, so once they come out of the freezer um, and they get into um, the grinders or however we decide to homogenize them, that'll, that'll take four weeks. There's several coolers of fish. Um, and then the lab, once they get their hands on them, they can turn around in three weeks. Brian, could you please send Betty your uh, presentation? Yes, I will. Thank you. Sure. This is a real elementary question, but how migratory are rainbows and Yeah, they, they do move around a lot. And that was a challenge in terms of trying to find reaches that were distinct from one another. So we tried to really put a lot of, a lot of distance between these locations. Um, rainbow trout can move up and down the river um, pretty easily. Uh, pike don't move as much. Um, I'm forgetting a typical home range of a pike now, and that can vary anyway. Some of them can be very migratory. Some stay pretty local. Um, that's a great question, and that's, you know, um, something that, that that could affect how these data are interpreted for sure. Additional comments or questions? The next agenda item is the burn study, and we're going to ask Bruce Sims to give you an idea of how we're going to tackle that at the end of the meeting. Right. Well, one of your handouts um, gives us, you know, we've taken we made an attempt of, uh, of commenting on the burn study, and we'd really appreciate any further input on that. And, and if, if what we've got written down is focused and let us know and uh, we'll alter it. And um, I'd be glad to st stay after after the meeting and if anybody has some ideas and things we should add, add that up. I'll be glad to stay and take notes and get them written down. Our deadline is September 14th. That's correct. And so uh, if everybody could please take a look at these and um, I would say Tuesday at the very latest. To have your comments back to us would be really, really helpful. September 11th. Mm -hmm. September 11th, Tuesday. We'd like to have all comments on the Thursday. I could not download the document. Now, could you give. Oh, the burn study document? Laura, yeah. did you get it finally? No. Uh, no. I couldn't download it. Too big. I well, wonder if you yeah. could, someone so, could give us a, just an overview of what the document said. Uh, it was a hundred and eight hundred pages. Yeah, it was and, an um, executive summary. It, it was a new field uh, file share. And Allie, I don't know, did it ever get added to the website? It should be on website, and I think that data should be going to be a hard copy here as well. It wasn't yesterday. It's not, it wasn't there yesterday. Uh, the online, it wasn't. Oh, it was online. Yeah. Do you know if there's a hard copy here? I can go look. I don't think there's been anything added to that for months. Okay. Well, the Dan and I got there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So but we thought we coordinated to have um, those. But it's hard to make comments if nobody can access them. Well, yeah, exactly. exactly. That is a problem. Yeah. So it's available on new fields document transfer site, and there's a link to that in the three emails that Sarah Sparks sent out for those of you who got. Mm -hmm. And apparently not everybody got that. So. Oh. 
Um, it was not on EPA's website yesterday because I actually went low and it wasn't there. But I was able to get it off of your fields. Okay. And yeah. The problem is the, the speed of the internet out here. It's so slow. The people yeah. who use the phone line, I couldn't download it either. I had to do it at work. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> so it is an issue. That's a, that's a, that's a true statement. I had the same problem. Okay. Well, now, can anybody say that the, the, the firm study showed that at a certain level it overflowed the banks or didn't overflow the banks? Their conclusion was that there, in a 100 year flood, that there'd be a four to five foot freeboard. Um, yes. It would overflow? No, I mean, it would oh, the dike would be higher than the year okay. flood. Well, we already had a damn near 100 year flood plan this year. Yeah, that was a 30 year <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> So, can I be? Yeah, it's in your hand there. <laughs> I can give you, you know, in this handout, we, we, we have uh, five bullets that basically summarize what we gleaned out of the, the high points. I can go through those if you'd like. Um, so we'll start here. Run. Yeah. If, if it's okay with everyone, we were thinking of putting that to the end of our agenda so that yeah. we can address a few more bigger items that people were looking for, like the virtual tour of the mill. Is that okay, Larry? Mm -hmm. Do you meet Bruce? Good. Um, I'd really like for you to get with Bruce on that, because I think your comments would be really relevant and important. Um, yeah. And Betty did get me a hard copy, so I didn't find it to read the whole thing. I think Allie, they, they, I don't know what they're adding, but they are okay. the firm and the geotechnical okay. reports. Okay, so. But I am working on, and Jennifer Cherico will be at the tour and our community development coordinator with EPA. She'll be at the next tag. And so we're still working out the kinks on who's bringing documents and how to update Betty to get it out to the CAC if there's been new hard copies added to the repository. So hopefully we'll be getting smoother at giving you guys access to everything. Here's another summary if somebody wants it of the firm study. Nope, going on. Okay, back to the table. <laughs> Okay, is everybody okay if we move on to the virtual tour of the mill site? Do we need to close down the light? I might help. I hope everybody will be able to see. I'll try to do my best here to make sure. Smurfit site primarily, but also some sites in Montana, Lockwood, um, a Lockwood site, and also up in Nyhart. It's got a host of issues going on up there. Um, the intent of this uh, virtual tour is not to replace the one we canceled, uh, you know, a couple months ago or a month ago. Uh, it's to provide information to the public uh, that uh, who have particularly not been on the site. Um, may not know where the landfills are, what they look like, um, what happened out there, what's in the pond, where, you know, how big is this place? So um, that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this. Um, I haven't connected yet. Just give me a second. Um, something funny happened to me today. I turned 50 last week, and today I got my first AARP uh, solicitation. Uh, I didn't think that was quite fair. I was going to say, there's nobody in here over 50 yet, is there? It's, let's see, a lot to see here, and I'll try um, flat so everybody can understand. Um, I, I get 
a lot of letters that the EPA gets, and I have to help them provide technical responses to those. So I see the, the letters from um, the CAG, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, the, the Salish Kootenai Tribe, uh, Missoula County, everybody. And there's a lot of requests in there. There's a lot of information that we have to sort through and, and basically triage. And it's not a triage to get stuff out of there. It, most of these comments are very good. Um, however, they may not be at the right time in the process of the uh, EPA Superfund. So right now, um, we are still under the remedial investigation. We're not doing characterization. Characterization is more of an in-depth, uh, you're defining the limits of the pond, you're de determining how much soil is in there, how much contamination is in there, and how you're going to deal with it. That's, that's down the road. So um, I want to make it clear that even though we've peppered this site with samples, it doesn't mean it's all over. Um, it doesn't mean we're, we're done, um, but it does mean that we are getting more information at each time we do a sampling event, and that information um, goes into the risk assessments and, and, and all the other uh, process of the human health and the ecological risk assessment, um, and um, it gives us information to make decisions to determine um, the contamination risks it, it, is the public or the environment at risk so um, we haven't decided that 100 percent yet that's that's still in the process yet so when that's figured out if there's a risk then we would go into characterization so um, with that said i'll go ahead and start this tour um, Terry, um weeks is here because he's going to keep me honest um, <laughs> all right so this is the the site boundary here's missoula um, French town up here, and here's the site boundary, and I'll zoom in on it, and again, I'll try to keep it straight up. So what I wanted to show first is that the height, uh, the, 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 height the, the length of the site from top to bottom is about four and a half miles right there, and if you were to draw a four and a half mile line in Missoula, starting at the interstate, you'd go all the way down to the um, uh, Fort Missoula, and you know, imagine, and, and, and then it's about two miles wide, so, so going down Reserve Street and a mile in each direction, all that land uh, and what's in it, and, um, and then watch the tour here. So just, just trying to put it into perspective. It, it's a pretty big site. So the main mill, the main gate is right there. Like, I'm just kind of doing this to hopefully orient people. Um, it doesn't look right. That's the main office building. Um, main gate is right here. Uh, here's the main road coming in from uh, the interstate in the French Town Y area. And um, the, the, there's several other gates. There's a train gate and some, some other gates up north. But um, the main industrial f facility, OU2, is here in red. The agricultural land, OU1, is in green. And OU3, which are the ponds, are pretty much the rest of it. So I'll take those off. And if we need to go back and see if something that's in a particular operable unit, uh, we can certainly do that. So I'll take all these off to keep the confusion down, because there's a lot of stuff on here. Um, one of the biggest questions we've had lately is uh, the, the status of the solid waste basins, the, the landfills. And there are quite a few out there. Um, I'm going to turn them on right here. Uh, where's, I'm going to put the boundary back on so at least we can see that. So the solid waste basins are here. We can zoom into them. Um, and each one of them has different material on it. Um, this is solid waste basin A. For example, this was the only one um, that has been reported to have uh, general refuse, meaning paper, plastic, glass, wood, uh, general uh, packaging materials, uh, other uh, landfill materials that are um, non-hazardous, so to speak. Um, so, and, and the others have, um, this is solid waste basin CB, and it has hog fuel ash and lime kiln grit. So hog fuel ash is um, the, the residue from the hog fuel boiler. Hog fuel is the scrape up of wood, chips, bark, debris that um, was still valuable as a fuel source for the property. And they use that to, I imagine, heat water and steam. 
Is that right, Larry? Well, I don't think that's ash area that you're showing. Right okay. There. That looks like the Avast asbestos landfill. Okay. Um, There's an asbestos landfill in there. I think you're right. Um, I got this out of the uh, out of the work plan. I was going to say that, that pond right there is, is a sludge pond. This pond right here is a sludge pond. That the took the sludge from the, from the clarifier. Right. And uh, that, nothing's been done with that other than there's you know you can walk around on it out there. Right. Not five though. This is this is four. Right. This That's, is five. Right. right. And this uh, this was a picture when it was. A lot more water in it. Now there isn't much water only down here in this part. Right. And that's got sludge in it also. This one is a solid waste uh, 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 basin that has been covered with tops or clay, right. 18 inches of clay. All of these have been closed in 1993 per the DEQ's closure requirements at the time. Um, well, this, this one right here is the solid waste uh, pond. For solid waste uh, dump. That's where That's all, the, okay. all the stuff went in. Anything, I'm, I'm anything that we had to throw away went into that pond. Right. There. right. That's solid waste basin. That's where the that's your general landfill. That's the general landfill. That's been covered with clay also. Right. right. All of these have all the everything. Well, not this one here. Why? It's why? Why it has a that's it's highlighted there. All okay. Well, now this one, this one is sludge that was pumped out of the aeration basin. So right. this would be bio sludge that was pumped into that one, but that hasn't been covered. According to the work plan, the remedial action work plan it has, but if you're saying I believe you, I, I, you were out there. So um, I'm not aware that that never was covered. All right, I'm going to double check that. But there were quite a few that were covered, um, and there is an asbestos landfill out there that is covered. There's another asbestos landfill in this area, too. In this one? Right in here. There's two of them, one here and, and one in this area. I'm not sure if it's here or here. But, all right. Well, I should have done some more homework. Um, okay. <laughs> Are they all, Larry, are they all covered with 18 inches of clay, or is that different? No, well, this one's covered that, yeah. with clay. This one's covered with clay. This one, I think, is covered with clay. There's asbestos uh, landfill. I think they just used the topsoil just to just cover it up. Out? So I don't think there was any and clay. That's, that's, that's not so much a leaching uh, risk. Uh, as, as, as say the sludge or, or other uh, general landfill stuff. So um, the only other landfill is G. I call it down in yellow because that is still active. Yeah, that's that's uh, sawdust, uh, dirt, uh, anything right. rocks, dirt, non bricks, non-metal, no, no sawdust rebar. And that kind of stuff. So and you can look at that. Um, you kind of see a, a small footprint on it. But that was all done back in '93 under DEQ uh, direction and. Um, when the plant had asked for uh, to permit landfills on site, we were denied. Why don't you just expand that just a little bit more? Yeah, there, okay, hold it right there. Uh, let me go through this 100-year uh, floodplain where the line goes. Uh, maybe you can raise it up just a little bit more. Let's see, the pond, I'm going to get away in here. Pond one, this, the 100-year floodplain goes around this pond here, goes down through here, down through, go down through here. Yeah, yeah. 18 is, uh, is uh, inside, down through here, Let's see. down here, and then roughly around in here. Right. So that, that's the FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency Act, or Act, um, floodplain uh, delineation. Um, I'm not sure when this one was done. Um, the, the PRPs have recently done a LIDAR survey to get a very high definition topographic uh, uh, contour map of this whole site. And uh, if, if you read the over, over top of the study, I've read that, I haven't gotten into the whole geotechnical report yet. Um, but what it comes down to is that um, that FEMA 100 uh, year floodplain uh, may be in question because uh, we were told that the, the overtopping study shows the, um, uh, the, the, the elevation of the burn is determined by that LIDAR study. There is still four to five feet of freeboard all along the river berm. Uh, 
uh, all along the, the main berm along the river uh, that would, uh, so it would not overtop the main berm. And I, I question the feed map. I don't necessarily question the LIDAR or anything like that, but I think there needs to be some more uh, looking into that as far as the hydraulics of the river during certain conditions to see how high it is and that sort of thing. Not just say the feed map says this, so that's where it is. Now, were you on site this year when they had the 54,000 cubic feet per second flow? I was not. Was anybody on the site? Well, well what was the yeah. feed board out there? Yeah. It didn't look like it was any four to five foot to me from the photo. Yeah, oh. that was a, yeah, it was more than four or five feet. That, but that wasn't a hundred year. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And to be clear, Wayne, one of, one of our concerns has been not overtopping, no. but there would be a lateral erosion of those, right. uh, well, I mean, as well as um, seepage from one way or the other. Right. That gets um, right. We know that. Right. That's a concern that we have. Yeah. Not so much the overtopping. That, that's the simple model that we can predict. But, those elevations. But my, my, my premise all along, and even if the dike were to wash out, the flood water is only going to go in and, and fill up that, those pond areas that I just outlined where the 100 year flood plan was. Well, just the fact that the dike washing out would have some negative effects on the river, just in and of itself. You know, having all that material washed in the river and to the, it's not a, you know, it's something we want to prevent. Yeah, well, you and I differ about what's going to wash into the river, right? Let's see what's going to well, wash Well, your example of even if the berm just washed in, even that in itself. Well, you got the sediment from the berm, yes. Yeah, it would not be a good that, I'm not worried about what's in the ponds. No. Uh, and, and, and if it did fill up the ponds, you know, you'd have to have another place downstream or it would outflow from the lower part of the pond. So you'd have to have two washout places for the material to, to leave the ponds. You just said the berms were permeable. What's that? You just said the berms were permeable. Yeah, they're permeable, but I mean, you're not gonna, anything that's in there now is gonna be leaching out through any permeability that's there. And that's not gonna be that much for you guys to be picking it up. So maybe we'll give Larry a chance to tell us more about what you've got. Pardon me? We're going to continue maybe now with what you have. Okay. Yes. All right. This, we can, each one of these topics can spur off in a million different directions, so I don't want to try to keep on task. Um, thanks for the clarification and, and the questions as well. Um, so the, these are the landfills. Um, according to the RI, they, these have caps. Um, I wasn't aware that the asbestos landfill didn't have a clay cap, but um, I will check into that. And it's not a big deal for asbestos. If it's, not exposed to the air, friable, um, and then it's generally uh, not considered as a serious health risk uh, as long as it's encapsulated. Um, it's not generally a leaching issue. Uh, so the sludge, pond, uh, the sludge ponds are next, and those are the ponds that uh, materials were, uh, when the clarifiers, uh, I'm sorry, the aeration, Came, that, that came out of the, the material came out of the aeration basins. Um, when they would get filled up, they would put a, put the uh, remnants in these sludge. Actually, boxes. those are where the clarifier sludge was sent. This just from the clarifier right here. Yeah, right. This pond right here, pond three, was the first pond that was used by the mill when the clarifier wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. So sludge settled out there uh, when when they routed that. And that was, after the clarifier went in, they pumped it to here, and here, and here. Okay. So that, that part is all, none of this has been covered with, with clay. Right. This has been covered with so, uh, chips. Chips, chips, to keep the dust down. Right. Yes. Right. Um, okay, and hopefully at the end, I've got a, a, a general flow path of the, uh, just the water treatment process. There's a lot of different flow paths that the plant site had for different operations, but it gets really confusing, and I wanted to try to just show the general water treatment uh, uh, just for, for our purposes here. Uh, so. so I have, uh, let me see. These are not in order. I do have the major berms. Um, lined out here. As Larry said, the inner berm is the brown one. 
that uh, that's around right around the hundred year floodplain, and the yellow one is the uh, the Clark Fork River berm that this study is all about. And there's still be maybe some questions about uh, whether that has to be investigated as well as secondary berm uh, down the road, but we're not there yet. We're still reading our 800 pages on the first one. Um, so back in 2016, the PRPs requested the EPA, um, so we sampled in 2015, the, the PRPs requested the EPA that they could clean up two sites that came up high in PCBs, and that was the high density fault tank. I'm going to turn off the cell phones here. So the high density fault tank and the transform transformer storage building. There's two sites out of several sample sites that we um, found PCBs above uh, uh, regulatory lim limits, and um, the PRPs volunteered to clean it up and backfill it. Um, it doesn't mean they're done with their PCBs at all. Um, it means that we found something and they took care of it, and they're going to, um, if they want to drive against this building, I have a lot of questions because um, what you don't see here is all the old other tanks and, and other features that were in between the, the paper mill building and the fence uh, over, you know, over there. So they're, they're, these buildings have all been torn down and busted up and everything, but you know, again, our sampling density, you'll see it here in a minute, uh, was pretty intense, and the, um, the sample results haven't shown a lot of PCB uh, presence, uh, except for these two areas. Um, so, I just want to point those out. There's two, two spots, one on the north end of the paper mill building and one towards the south, that um, will be um, uh, considered I mean, we won't be looking at those areas anymore, but it does, I want to make sure that the area was not finished uh, as far as PCBs. So, um, uh, let's see, I meant to show these two. I'm jumping all over. I thought I had this better organized. Um, there's four outfalls on the site during operation. Uh, outfall one is furthest to the south, the most upstream site. Outfall two is right next to it. Number two was never used for many, many years. Really, so it was used no. early, but, but not later? It was used uh, probably back in the early <coughs> days. Uh, uh, I don't even recall ever using that when I was out there. And okay. I was out there for, what, 32 years. Right. And an outfall is, is basically a discharge point into the river. Um, all yeah. of these were under compliance at the time. They had, they had regulations they had to meet in the process street, not, not so much out here. They had to meet it way back through the plant. So that anything else, as far as chemicals go, um, they were meeting their requirements uh, for, for, for their discharge permits, uh, as far as we can find from, from the Mid-Montana mid uh, Discharge Elimination System uh, records. Number three was a major outfall which had a diffuser in the river, and so we tried to put as much of our discharge through that outfall as we could. So that came out in the middle of the river? Yes, right. It was a diffuser at several points where it was discharged in the river. Can, can, can maybe one of you clarify um, this, but you, you mentioned about meeting all the permitting requirements. It's only since the 80s that permits were in place, so it operated for 30 years without, with no permits. Right. Yeah. It, it did. It's a fact. And, and, and you know, what do you do about that? I love, uh, there's, there's, well, yeah, no, it's like yeah, when we mentioned that it, yeah. you know, it met all the permitting you know, and as they were made, right? right. I mean, you're right. That's a very good point. So that, that's the flip side. Is that when there was no regulation, what happened, right? And then that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so, Larry, I have a simple question. Sure. What's in the sludge? We talk about these sludge ponds. Could you or this? I think Larry might be able to basically what? fiber. Pulp fiber, uh, there'd be some other material in there. Uh, there's some uh, just normal dirt and debris and so forth. The, the majority of it's going to be fiber. Probably two thirds of it is going to be fiber or organic. What about from the bleaching plant? Yeah. What? The bleaching plant. 39 years of bleaching, it has to. Well, that was called liquid. That, that would be your, your, your uh, 
chlorides from the bleaching operation and any dioxins and so forth, those were all liquid. So there, uh, sure there would have been some bleach call uh, out there at that time, uh, up until 99, I think it was, when they stopped bleaching. Mm -hmm. Would the bleach pulp be part of the sludge in these sludge? It was at that time, up until 99. It was? Yeah. So when we say sludge, it's a mix of the wood fiber and some bleach fiber? Well, I mean, the fiber's the same. I mean, all, it, the difference between whether it's brown fiber or white fiber. The bleach is white fiber and the brown is, is like a cardboard box. So you wouldn't even be able to see the bleach fiber in that sludge. I mean, of course, you know, that sludge has been sitting there for um, how many years? Uh, 18 years now? Yeah. Um, try to keep going here. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to show all the sample locations to date, and um, I've got most of them on here. There was a round of sampling in 2014 that Newfields did on their, uh, not on their own, but they did it without EPA oversight. EPA oversight. Uh, EPA initially rejected the data and required uh, the PRPs to come back and resample most of, almost all those locations plus a lot more. So that sampling happened in 2015. That's that's these points right here. Some of these are composites. Uh, some of them are two, you know, uh, look like if you zoom in on one of these, say on, it will it will break apart. I'm sorry. Maybe not. Let me try another one. There, there's two. So there's a surface sample. This was from two to ten centimeters, and then there's a deeper one that went from 10 to 18 centimeters. So um, each little dot not just one sample point. It may represent several samples. There's there's some well borings that we have uh, five or six samples from. But that's just the 2015 sampling. And it, you can see it's a pretty busy little map just from that. Um, but can you can you do a size comparison again on um, one of those uh, sites just to give so us some clarity? Do a, a how, how large like each a small section of that is so we can get an understanding. Hold on a second. Let me, let me turn them all on and let you see, uh, Jennifer. Uh, all set. All set. So it gets really busy. Um, we So 2016, we did, or 2017, we did grid sampling for the human health risk assessment. That's all these purple dots. And again, that's trying to get an average for each basin. So if you zoom into a basin, um, you can see it's pretty well uh, covered with, with samples. Uh, again, these are composites, so it's not an individual sample, but if there was a high level of uh, contamination, we would have picked it up. Uh, it doesn't take much uh, you know, dioxins or, or metals to, to be able to pick it up. And, and what depths were those? Excuse me? What depths? Um, these, these were surface samples. Um, these were uh, zero to six inches, I believe. So, Larry, um, this, what you're showing us, um, is this available to anybody to access? I, I really believe so. Uh, first of all, all this information is in the work plan and the identity. Yeah, right. But it, you don't want to type in every report, and I promise you that. And, uh, yeah. uh, let me ask for you. <clears throat> okay. uh, it should be available. EPA, it's, 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 what is the EPA work product? Where does it come from? This is a KML file that we received from the PRPs uh, after their sampling plan was finished. KML file is something you use in the geographic information system and it's coordinated to yeah. the map. And you can open it with Google Earth. But again, the data, uh, all these points in public, uh, public access. So I, I don't see a problem with that, but I can't give it to you without asking Sarah first. Well, I guess there's the, 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 the ability to use what you're, what you're showing us. Is mm -hmm. that available to anybody sitting in this room if they just wanted in their own free time, sit around and poke around and just see what, what's going right. on? Right. And again, I don't see a problem with that, but I, I can't commit to giving yeah, it to you. Yeah, Larry, uh, yeah. we would love to have that available okay. to us on our tour. I've got the Next files, week. but I, I need to Yeah, just, absolutely. That I, would be great. I have no problem with that. And like I said, it just, you know, I wasn't going to sit there and type in every no. X, Y, and Z coordinate for, for every one of these couple thousand points we got on here. So, <laughs> Um, so that was the density. Pardon me. I know we're talking about like there's a lot in the area, but do you have sort of the, the density of this 
the sampling, like per acre? Per mm -hmm. Each each one is different. Um, again, the uh, the agricultural areas at OU uh, one, you know, may have only had um, one or two samples per field if you want to break them up by these lines in the field. This has three, these are all surface samples. Uh, that one actually has a surface and a, a deeper one, uh, same here. But uh, as we got into the areas where we ex uh, did expect, where we thought there may be uh, potential to have more contamination, um, we definitely added more samples uh, to those. And Again, the, the, the initial sampling plans were for risk assessment. We're not characterizing these ponds. We're not determining the, the volumes of contamination at this point. We're just trying to find it and how it, and, and, and where has it gone. So, um, and then determining a risk based on that. So, um, back to the sampling here. Um, no, it's getting, it's already set. So there were um, the sampling that actually happened as part of the addendum nine, and, and I didn't I didn't zoom off for any of that. But if you look, it's not just on the site. The samples continued all the way up past Houston, <coughs> Fork, Fork River sediment, water, um, and as of August uh, this year, uh, small small fish and macroinvertebrates along the Clark Fork River and upstream of the Clark Fork River uh, and the Bitterroot as well. We didn't go as far as, as we wanted to on the uh, uh, August sampling, but we did get a lot more data, and that may be something we'll have to catch up and catch down the road. Um, so that was the 20, let's see, 2018 sampling. Uh, again, that's the identified uh, macroinvertebrate, small fish, mammals, they caught mice out there, and I can show some pictures, I don't know how much, uh, is this supposed to go to 8? So you go to 7.30? 7.30. So maybe oh. 10 more minutes. Okay, let's just stop me when I stop rambling too much. Um, it, it, like you said, you didn't go as far upstream as you wanted to with the fish sampling, so what, what sites were out? No, well, was it, was there was a tremendous response from, from Fish Wildlife Parks, Missoula County, and the CAG, and everybody. Uh, to sample the same sites that were sampled during the, the uh, large fish tissue. Uh, there was a conflict. The, the PRPs didn't think that was necessary and didn't have, uh, uh, didn't felt we, we were able to just, the EPA was able to justify uh, adding those samples to their program. And rather than fight about it, uh, it was decided to uh, proceed with the sampling and add those later if we need to. And it's not at the same time, it's, it's an unfortunate event, but the, the, the alternative would have been uh, the potential for the PRPs to pull their sampling program and not do it. And uh, we, we felt it was better to have data than to not have data. But yeah, I was asking you said not as far as you wanted, but I didn't know that meant you did less than you proposed. No, no, we, we did what was proposed, but we had a tremendous public comment to go farther out. And we requested that, and it was rejected, and it would have gotten a big argument. And, you know, we like to argue. No, no it's it's not not <laughs> you just made it sound like it wasn't. Yeah. No, we, we felt we followed the plan. As a matter of fact, I give the sampling team a lot of credit. They were out there for uh, two weeks straight, weekends, and they would get up early, go out and set the, the mouse traps, um, and uh, uh, do that till about 10 o'clock. The same team would go out, start waiting around the pond, collecting bugs and mud and uh, water, and then uh, by about 4 o'clock, they'd finish up, and then they actually they'd set the traps at night and check them in the morning. So they check the traps in the morning, do their sampling all day, and then go set them at night, and then go back to the lab and process all the information from the day. And it was a very tedious form, and they did a very good job as far as I was the oversight. I was out there for 12 out of the 14 or 15 days that were, they went out there. And, uh, uh, the sampling team was, was pretty good. They, 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 they followed their, their quality assurance plan. They didn't have any decon issues. Um, what I saw out there was uh, it was very good compared to most of the sample programs. And, and you know, I know the, 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 the Big Fish uh, program has some issues. I've never ran into a sampling program that didn't have an issue. Uh, so uh, there, things happen, and you know, it's just up to us to come to an agreement on how to deal with it and, and that everybody accepts. Um, 
Um, Larry, did they did they get the long made long nose dates? Did they get the ones the small ones? Yes. So you can probably relate that data back to the larger fish and see if they move yep. around. They got the long nose days, the macro bird, the little bugs that the birds eat, the, and um, the, the mice. Um, they're collecting mice at many locations out there. I don't have all those locations on here, but um, it should be it should provide us a whole lot of information on the site. There, well, I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of biotics collected. Um, so I will get off the sampling for a second here and um, turn off some of those outfalls. And I just wanted to show a quick process flow diagram for the, for the wastewater and just give everybody an idea of what happens on site at the time. Larry, we might be able to know this. I just read it last night on the on here, but um, so wood, chip, wood uh, logs or wood chips are brought into the bill. And they were either brought in, I imagine, by rail um, or from trucks. And there were other gates that other you know, trucks may have come in, but they would be uh, brought up, and the chips would probably be put in the store, in the chip yard. And I'm guessing if they were full logs, they were chipped up, uh, put on a conveyor, washed, sent to the digester. From the digester, um, you know, they get rolled into paper eventually, and um, that water that is used in the process. Um, comes in, and it's, this is a tremendous uh, feature for this site. Um, right now there's, um, how many wells down there? Uh, eight, nine. Eight, nine. One of them's number 12, so I thought there'd be at least 12, but, um, but if you look, there's all these wells down on the south end of the site. They're very high production wells. Uh, all the pumps, as far as I know, are still down there, and that will, that's basically what, I'm sure they used local wells originally, but as Yeah, they had some wells at the north side, which have been in the north time. Right, <clears throat> excuse me, but as the process uh, grew and demand for paper uh, for this particular site grew, they, they drilled a huge well field down here. And water rights along the Clark Fork River, uh, for that much water is a very good use value, in my opinion. Um, whether you build a water park or you have a ranch or whatever, uh, whatever future use of the property, I think that's going to be a, um, uh, a useful uh, plus. Uh, uh, you know. There's one more well that isn't shown on there. Number nine, uh, the ninth one down there. There's one right over there. Oh, in there? Yeah. Uh, right, right over there. You see the rope comes right down right here. Yeah, okay. Oh, I missed that one. So that's where the water came in, uh, went into the plant, and from there uh, we had the main treatment loop. And this is pretty confusing, uh, but basically from the clarifier, which is this Start, what I call the start of the treatment process. Is that reasonable to say yeah, that everything came from the plant? Went to the clarifier. Primary, primary treatment. Primary treatment. Um, went into the aeration basins. Um, was uh, can uh, the two cells of the aeration basin. Right here. And then, the more, then it goes into the polishing pond. Right. North polishing pond, south polishing pond. Mm -hmm. You, you want to sit here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. But you're right. This is the North Polishing Pond. This is the South Polishing Pond. Or oh, down here. Back, back into uh, Pond 1 and 1A. One 1A. One and 2. But basically, we tried to keep the flow going 7. Uh, actually, we went into uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13A. Third, or 13 and 13A and out. Right. I felt pretty good about that. So. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then there was also a non-contact cooling water discharge that came out of the mill. Um, it went along a ditch uh, to the far north of the uh, plant and uh, went out discharge uh, out on the floor. Well, actually, it, it continues <laughs> on and goes down. Sorry. No, it's okay. It goes down into this slough over here. And, and this is a, one of the uh, habitat restoration areas that, that, I, that I worked on out there. So basically the water seeps away from this spot and none of it gets out here into the outflow. But we did have, when there was a flow going into the outflow, we had to measure temperature. We had to make sure that it got down the temperature before it entered the river. 
All right, well, that, those are the main features that I have here. I'm sorry it's kind of jumpy, but um, I'm hoping that uh, this provides information that um, you can use to ask questions during the tour next week if you go, or ask questions as we review these documents. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have a little bit of an understanding. Again, there were other processes that went on there, but we don't have the time, or I don't have the, the little arrows on my drawing to, to do that. So um, I'll, I'm glad to take any questions, so I'll just a few minutes. We didn't, on the first tour, we didn't go anywhere near there. Which way? Uh, the, the end of the blue mark. Right. And there, we didn't go anywhere near there. I don't think we did. We did not. That's something we can see. There's, no, there's water in the cooling water ditch, but it's from irrigation uh, over here. It comes across uh, and it backs up a little bit, but there's nothing right now um, coming out of the plant. And, uh, we sampled that as part of the identity uh, line uh, sampling the water. <coughs> there weren't any bugs in it uh, because I think it's backwater that comes and goes as the irrigation uh, demand changes. So uh, we didn't see too many uh, insects to collect in that uh, ditch. I hate to keep interrupting you, but there's the Grass Valley French ditch comes across right there. And that does come in here. That's so there is there's a flow coming from the Grass Valley French ditch right. that's in that ditch. Right, and like I said, it backs up to a, a little weird. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't even know if it backs up that it does. much. <laughs> uh, anyway, that water just basically seeps, like I said. Before. Right, okay, so it gets into the, the wetland areas there yeah. and just uh, infiltrates towards the river and that's the, that's the, the discharge for the cooling water ditch. But generally, a non-contact cooling water ditch means that it doesn't come in contact with the product that's being made. Uh, it's usually used like a radiator where water will, uh, cold water will come in, uh, or hot water will come in, uh, this is cooling water. So it would have been cold water coming in, uh, cooling down a hotter water through a radiator type mechanism, and then being discharged, but never touches that other water. That other water would be a, a primary coolant or a primary uh, water from the mill, which may or may not have uh, chemicals in it, but uh, a non-contact water is generally uh, consider a fairly clean uh, water. But again, we didn't sample the water uh, coming from the plant right now. We don't, there, there's nothing that's dry from there all, all the way back. So um, that's, uh, <clears throat> I think that's all. Um, what else? Other questions? Uh, yes. I'm just curious if you have um, a button for the groundwater flow for the water. Um, I have, we have maps and there's some really interesting stuff going on with the groundwater flow and uh, I think the groundwater, there, you know, there, there's been many papers that say there's two aquifers, a shallow and deep aquifer. Um, the, deep, the, the wells down here on the south are all tapped into the deep aquifer. Uh, we have many, many, many water, uh, shallow monitoring wells up here and, and generally if the landfills were uh, leaching, we should pick something up in those first. Um, however, we do have some deeper wells as well that uh, are paired with some of the shallow wells so we can compare uh, water quality from the deep, uh, deep aquifer and shallow aquifer at the same location. And uh, there's quite a few of those along there. Um, answer your question. Yeah, I didn't answer your question. Groundwater flow is basically in this direction. It's going from here to the river. And the mill could not have operated the way we did with percolation out of these ponds if the groundwater went any other direction. Because if it went off site, we'd hear about it. And we didn't have any problem with, with people's wells uh, showing up with color in their well. So, so the groundwater you, basically goes toward the river. So are you saying the river probably took the lion's share of whatever? It's all of it. From the mail, from the mail. That's, yeah, I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't sit here and tell you that, but it, with everything that we've been saying as far as not having regulation up until a certain point, uh, and, and using these basins for infiltration, uh, and you know, they were permeable bottoms, they're gravel bottoms, they're no secret. And as a matter of fact, we saw during the high water that there is communication, so uh, that's happened. You know, that's, that's where we're at, yes. And given that, and given what we know is in the waste management area, and given that EPA needs to acknowledge that it's, we know it's contaminated with groundwater, we know there's bad stuff in there, we know it's essentially been unregulated uh, for most of the, the time it's been there, 
why continue to wait and not do something about it as you conduct a lot of How can, how can we you see prove? that we see the PCB areas you clean as a great model for that? Yeah. We you identify it as a toxic area. And so you call them up and got them out of there, that's the larger study continues. You gotta remember the mill was put here and Missoula County thought it was a pretty good deal. Um, I, I, I sure. Sure. I'm they provided great jobs, I know, but now I, there's a there's a bill due for the profits those companies took out of here, and it involves restoring this floodplain, removing the contaminants from it, particularly those that are not stored safely, that aren't out of harm's way, that are chronically contributing to the groundwater and discharging to the river. I think everybody here is on that same page. Um, you know, as a consultant to the EPA, we're having a hard time uh, proving that. You know, uh, you know, the, 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 there's, there's. Well, one, we are, we've already. Sorry. I mean, you were at the meeting with the commissioners. The EPA and the DQ have already acknowledged that. The waste management area is a problem, that it's contaminating groundwater, that the status quo is not a long-term option, that some cleanup is, le is necessary. Yeah. Why delay that for many more years while the remediation, or the remedial investigation? Well, hopefully not many years, but right. we have to follow the circle process. So we're finalizing the risk assessments right now to identify any other areas of risk. And part of that is trying to link the site to the river. And so that's what we've hopefully accomplished and we might have to do further sampling to continue to see that link there. But we know there are risk associations with sludge ponds. We're following the circle process and doing the risk assessments first and then we can do move into feasibility study and look at how what exactly is there, what are the options for cleaning it up, and then we'll be at that stage. But I need a circle it takes a long time we're trying to move it as fast as we can. I guess I'm wondering why the feasibility study of the waste management area can't occur concurrently with the remedial investigation and the risk assessments given that we know that it is particularly dangerous to the site and that it's located in a site designed to discharge to the river as we just heard. Well, we haven't found anything that's particularly dangerous. We found some of the exceedances. Within the waste management area? I mean, I know most of it hasn't been sampled in detail. Right. But well, we know that there's groundwater contamination there. Again, um, if you look at the, the levels, they're not uh, as high as some wells we're seeing in Missoula and, and Butte and other cities around. Um, we're not saying it's good, uh, but it, it, we're not saying we're not going to take care of it, but we're at a point in the process where we're trying to determine how bad it is and what's the risk to, to the people around it and the environment around it. And if you, to me, you look at the environment, it's a pretty healthy environment. I, it just look just visually, whether they're, they're, all the animals are toxic, you know, contaminated. I don't know. We'll find out here pretty soon. Well, in the, in the levels we found, there's no human exposure risks right now. Like people don't aren't on the site always. There's no levels that PPA feels is an immediate threat, and so that's why it doesn't need to be addressed by like the removal branch where they come in and they're like, this is immediately threatening human health. That's not happening at this site, and so we're following the process through remedial versus removal, which is a lot quicker when they see that immediate human health threat. But because people don't live and aren't exposed daily, and I, those I don't even think we have levels that would require that if people were on site daily, but what we have and the exposure risks that we have don't mean we have to do a immediate removal. And so we're working with the staff we have and doing the best we can to work through the circle process, but it is limited. I do take exception to your comment that it's a healthy environment. When you go out there, it's a moonscape. I disagree. There's, not, there's nothing, uh, there's a lot of, I see a lot of bare land with weeds growing. I don't consider that as an ecologist a hmm. healthy environment. Well, I just watched the, uh, and I'm not, I, I don't want to argue, I, I was out there for the uh, ecological sampling. And, you know, those ponds that are barren landscapes are full of insects. Whether they're good insects or bad insects, I'm not, I can't tell you that. But they, um, there is an ecosystem out there, and it, it, it's, it, 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 it seems to be thriving uh, due to the amount of wildlife that you see, just visually again, like I said. And like I said, we'll know pretty soon if some of those are, 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 are contaminated or not. But, um, you know, is it perfect? No, but for a 3,000 acre paper mill, I think it's doing pretty good. And I, I don't think it's a, a crisis. Um, it's something we need to fix and, 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 and move forward in a, in a positive way and make sure that we have uh, done our due diligence and not missed anything. I, I don't want to think, I don't want you to think we're blowing this off or making this any smaller than it is because 
uh, it, it is a big site and it, it's a big issue and obviously everybody here is concerned about it. And, um, it so I totally agree with the statement that you need to do your due diligence. I just hear you skipping ahead to a conclusion that I haven't seen any data yet that would support that conclusion. That it's a healthy environment? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll retract that. I, I, I don't know if it's healthy, but I, I see otters and eagles and moose and birds, and bugs, and birds, hundreds of birds, eagles, snipe. Uh, I, I, to me, you can't see that in Missoula. Is Missoula unhealthy because they don't have it? I don't think so, but. So, you're kind of skipping ahead there. I'm just asking that you wait until there's data to. Sure, ask we'll see the data. That's what I did say. We just, you just told us we have to follow the process. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, sorry for projecting that. Back to you. I also don't think it's a fair comparison to say is Missoula unhealthy because it doesn't have moose walking down Main Street. No, of course it doesn't. Um, and, and the issue of there are a lot of bugs, that's somewhat meaningless. I mean, when we did the comparative analysis with the flathead and the elk, what we found is, yeah, you can have a lot of bugs in a foul ecosystem. It's all the bugs that are tolerant of high levels of pollution. So you, you can't make those kinds of broad generalizations. I'm not a, I'm not a biologist. I saw, I'm, I'm an engineer, but I do go outside a lot and I see polluted sites versus non-polluted sites, and I draw those conclusions myself, not not for the EPA or anything else. That's, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, I don't have the, the biological background to make those kind of statements, so I, 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 I take back what I said as far as uh, it being a healthy environment. We don't know. Mary, I, I appreciate that comment. And before, um, oh, just real briefly, I don't know if you follow this, but it, it is, it, I'm glad Mary brought it up because you know, a good portion of that site is, is covered with not just weeds. That's a fact. Yeah, it's and, a farm. Uh, That's a, I agree. Well, no, no, I'm not talking about the weed weed. No, a it, it's a farm with noxious weeds. Farm with noxious weeds, weeds. It's yeah. 3,000 yeah. acres, or yeah. about 1,200 acres. And, uh, and that, has very, that has very limited use by a lot of species, especially our, our native ones. You will find a lot of mice on those sites in incredibly high densities, especially if there's a lot of nap weed, because they eat the nap weed for um, the party. Right, you know, but um, but just just echo Mary's point. I mean, there, there's there's vast areas of there that are, especially those ponds, that have no vegetation on them, and there, you can even see the old scrapings from when those were initially dug, right, 50 years ago or, or whatever. Um, and that's not healthy. Well, no, I, I don't know if that's from 50 years ago. Uh, well, I'm guessing they raked those bottoms to help them better better on the road. Uh, okay, but you, is that better for? 20 years. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, well, restoration of all that land is something that needs to be addressed. Huh? Right. That's the point. That's it's, not, the point. <laughs> it's not a healthy ecosystem. Nice. It needs Thank restoration. Yeah. <laughs> 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 there's not many toxins there that we need to looking at. I mean, restoration is part of what I'm interested in, is trying to get that area back to, uh, to a good habitat, a better habitat than it is now. We've got another question back. Larry, first of all, thank you for, for going through this. This is helpful. Um, Missoula County and the water quality district's primary concerns, and a lot of others, have been with the with the sludge ponds and the landfills. Right. And and you, you went over the composite sampling, and it looks incredibly dense. I, I guess I have two questions. One is if that, that zero to six inches is really capturing surface capping, really, what has been capped. Um, and then the other, the other concern is really what the long term, I mean, I know there are monitoring wells out there, but it is hard with a site this large to get an accurate uh, picture of the impact that these landfills have had on groundwater as a resource. So we've got some, some sites that show elevated dioxins and some metals um, and, and just anaerobic um, conditions to produce kind of gross groundwater color. Um, but why is that not being, I, I, we met with EPA DEQ uh, right. last week, we talked about that, you know, characterization is gonna happen with the feasibility study. Right. Um, but we, as you mentioned, the characterization doesn't happen until the risk is there to show that it needs to be characterized and it needs right. to be removed. And our concern is that those, those lower samples of sludge and that, that, that real good characterization characterization of groundwater uh, isn't happening. Well, okay, we talk uh, about that. 
again, the 2015 sampling, 2014 and the 2015 sampling results, which are available, um, we did soil borings in all the ponds, not all of them, most of the, the sludge ponds and, and some of the other holding ponds and such. And um, that was the first round of information. Based on that information, we realized we didn't get a whole lot of shallow stuff. So back in 2017, uh, the human health risk assessment uh, uh, via data gap sampling uh, did the, uh, the grid sampling across the surface. So, um, you know, do I think that there's been enough deep sampling? It's a 3,000 acre site. I don't know if anybody will ever think there's been enough, but again, we're, we're doing a, a, a density of sampling that is uh, comparable to other Superfund site densities that should give us enough information to determine risk. And if we continue these addenda to the work plan and continue sampling, um, you know, hopefully we'll close up those risks and, and find out whether it is there or not. And if, if not, then you know, of course there's going to be more questions and we're going to have to do some more sampling. So I, I want to make that clear, we're not done. And we're not trying to uh, rush through this, and we're not trying to, um, uh, you know, just get away from it. Uh, we want to make sure what we're saying is right, like Brian said, we want to have defensible data, and we want to, um, you know, this, this is not just a, uh, EPA says do it, so do it kind of thing. I, I, as, since I've worked with EPA, I've learned this, that there's um, you know, compromises that have to be made. I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're making deals with the PRPs, but if the PRPs say no, they don't want to do this, then there's a chance that, like this last thing we did, like it may not happen this year, and who knows, if it doesn't happen this year, who's to say it will happen next year if there's still an argument going on? So uh, we're moving forward with the best information that we have and the best uh, uh, getting the best amount of data that we can get from the EPA. And at some point, the EPA can put their foot down and say, just do it. But that brings in the lawyers, and uh, as this is not a super fun site, that's going to get real sticky. So um, I think the EPA is playing their cards right as far as trying to uh, not say cooperate, but work with the PRPs in a way that uh, allows the EPA teams to get the information they need to determine if this site is a problem or not at this point. And um, I hear everything everybody's saying. I believe I've read pretty much all your letters. So um, I understand the, the concerns. And I don't want to be up here too long and blow it off. But uh, uh, you know, there's still a lot to be understood about this site. We, we haven't covered it, but we still, we still got to figure out a lot of stuff. So what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I had one more comment, and then I think we've got to wrap it up and hear about the site tour next week. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's interested in in learning more, discussing more, having more questions raised, there's going to be a site tour. So let's take our last comment, and then we'll hear about the site tour. I, I can hold. Can you? Yeah, I can hold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank Larry for pulling us in, but it, it's raised more questions, I think. Than <laughs> yeah, I figured it might, and I'm hoping the tour next week will help answer a few. And um, again, my cards are up here. If you guys want to give me a call, you know, um, feel free to grab a card. And, Again, I can't commit to a whole lot of uh, uh, providing documents or data without the EPA's approval, but I can hopefully answer some questions. That would be really great to have on our tour if you can. I know it's, you've got to go through some. Yeah, those are really All these points you can put on your phone, and while we're out there sampling, I said, I need to go to sample you know, P3A, so where is it? It would take the right to go. It's pretty handy if we have these on the tour. So,
at 1 o'clock at the mill site. Main, um, main gate. Main gate. Um, we all have a beach bus graciously donated by Betty. Um, Jan has lined up uh, a microphone, a PA, so we'll be able to hear. And then we're going to go through the list of um, tour site stops. That list is at the back of the room. If you didn't see it yet, there's a list of tour sites. Any questions about the site? Tour? Has the, sewer, or the tour site stops been confirmed? And is that, you know, We're just stop? about there. I think yeah. after tonight's presentation, we may want to add a couple more. Um, I, some notes that I took that I, I'd like to add, and obviously with Larry's um, hopeful files, we can add some more. But we're really close, Ali. What um, what would be the best? What date would you guys like our our definitive tour stops? I think the earlier the better, but by early next week, if possible, then we can put together additional information or maps to have for you guys. So. The earlier the better, if you get it by sometime Tuesday at the latest. We'll have it to you Tuesday, yep. <laughs> I just wanted to throw something out for the case consideration for the tour is, um, you know, I was looking through the, the reconnaissance report for the firm and noted that it was done, that reconnaissance was done in April before we had the big flood. Um, I would like to suggest that maybe make the berm, you know, spend some time on the berm looking at those uh, sites that were identified to see how they held up and how, and to hear more about how some of those um, issues like the burrows, the trees, uh, I think there's was an undercut berm, how that could affect seepage or, or stability of the berms. And, mm -hmm. It just, you know, and it seems like this is something we can actually see, not, you know, we can't see the toxins out there, but we can see the condition of the berm, and I, I think that's a really high, a high interest to everybody, just based on the discussion tonight. So, just wanted to throw that out as maybe making that kind of a highlight of the field trip. Mary we spent a lot of time on it the last time we were out there. We, by the berms, we were very, um, it was, it was pretty quick, so. And I'd like to actually add to our list, um, as David pointed out, there's areas where there's absolutely no vegetation, and this is a time of year that there would be vegetation, and so it might be handy to also um, point those areas out as well. Anybody's welcome to be on that tour, so tell your friends and neighbors you want to fill up the bus. Just RSVP. Yeah, we yeah, got RSVP. Must Just RSVP. Don't show up. Yeah. And they cannot be an attorney. Oh, you cannot be an attorney. <laughs> or a child. Or a child. Or a child. <laughs> <laughs> or a child. Like the high school kids are out. All right. We have a couple more things. Um, we're going to table the reports from the working groups in one of our time. And we wanted to just make sure the addendum nine public comment summary is made available to everybody tonight. Mm -hmm. Is that on the back table? Yep. Yeah. And it was sent out electronically. Okay. If you didn't see this addendum nine public comment summary on the back table, if you don't find one, please talk to Betty. She'll send it to you. And then I think we're to setting our next meeting. Yeah, um, we definitely want to, um, as Larry said, um, at that point, we'll have the um, community involvement plan. Um, so I think that's really important. Also, we'd like to have a recap of the site visit. Um, and then the, uh, our comments are due September 14th. Brian. When would we maybe see response from comments? That will, 
That's for the firm, the uh, investigation. That's if yeah, Brian would have to do that. Um, I know, but do you, I mean, do you know what the typical timeline is? For a do you know? I can ask Sarah. Okay. I don't know. Maybe just an update? A response to comments on this September 14th. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Does anybody want to continue having more information in this virtual form and have Q&A post-site with it? Would you be willing to come back and sure. you can have more? This was really interesting. I, I hope it was. I hope we are tuned up a little better. Uh, watch what I say. You know, I think after the site visit, once you're, you know, when you look at something on the site in here, and I think having the ability to have that on our phones will really help us um, have dialogue again about some of the things that we didn't see the first tour, and I think that will really be helpful. What that doesn't have right now, uh, it's not a full GIS system, it has location and sample ID and some, some initial data on the sample. Um, it doesn't have the sample results, so if, you, if you're driving around the site on the tour and you say this is pond, P3, it had all these samples done on it. You could look on your phone and say, all right, I sampled this, and you write it down, and then you could go to the report and uh, this the data summary report and find out what the results were if you're really interested in that particular sample. But um, it's a lot of work to put that much information on all those points to get all that, that sample data uh, results on. Um, Newfields has done a great job actually getting all that you know, correlated as it is now. So. Is there any way that we could have some of the higher levels pointed out prior to our tour so that we could? Yeah, and that's, yeah, it's all in the point of data summary reports. Um, I'll see if I can make that on the next person. Yeah, if we get up those areas, that would be good. Karen? And again, I apologize because you know, I'm not being here. But who exactly is the community groups technical advisor who who has that role so we are um, tasked with um, doing some tag uh, we're gonna apply for a tag okay so right now there isn't we're flying specific. without one yeah sure. but we've had a, but, but you know what Jen is 100% correct we've got so many people in this room that have been so gracious with their technical expertise, and we're absolutely blessed to have them on on board. And it's been, I mean, Missoula County, Bruce, um, Larry, I mean, there's just so many people in this room. Jen, I mean, lots and lots, Shannon as well. Jerry, I was looking at the numbers because I wanted to tell my, my people at ATSDR, about half the people that come are residents or former workers, a quarter are from the government, and then a quarter fit into some other, yeah. so like Audubon, I put Larry on that uh -huh. so yeah. And he's a former worker, so I guess he goes into those. But we have a lot of people here that are really, really well informed. Very savvy and extremely. And if you read our comments that we've submitted to EPA, that really is very evident because there's um, there's some really, really just high level of technical expertise that's come into this. This is an amazing group. I have never encountered this before. And I've been doing this 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we don't have a, quote, technical advisor per EPA standards, but um, we're pretty selfish that we have what we do. But yeah, we're working towards that. And I know that that would be, um, our, our group would continue, obviously, the same trajectory with working with the TAG. Any other agenda items for October 4th? I'm talking Larry Campbell into Brian. 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 Yeah, because there's some correspondence that's gone with it, and we can bring that up at the next October meeting. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. sure.
Anything else on the agenda that we can't go home without hearing about? We know that Bruce wants people here for the Berm study, so stick around if you want to comment on that. Do you want to have people discuss health? Issues? If anybody has heard of any health concerns that they would like me to relay on and address in my final report, that would be great. And when's your final report going to be due? It's going to be a while. Because I'm going to try to review the upcoming data too. So, and this is this is kind of new for Montana. So my first report took like six months to get out. So yeah. Anything new from Missoula County? What way guys are? Um, no, we well we're working on um, our own comments regarding the burn stability study, um, and met with uh, uh, DEQ and EPA. Last week, Allie came down and Sarah and Keith had a, a good discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so, nothing new, and I'm working on this. I think comments. we do have one thing because we talked with Anna Palmer. Oh, right? yes, yeah. And um, so she, Thank you. Yeah, she um, was the one working on the tax case yeah. for the county. Yeah. And um, she is working, or she checked in with the title company. Um, they're doing foreclosure in lieu of. No, tight, tight, deed in lieu of foreclosure. Um, and they do expect that to come about in about two weeks. And that they um, were told that all the back taxes, which are about $500,000 right now, would be paid as part of that happening. Um, and that closes on all of the uh, parcels except one. And one of the, she said one of the reasons why it was taking so long was because um, what they found is that there are several, I, I don't remember how many parcels in the teens um, that, that are shown, you know, when you look at the parcel map, but actually if you look at the legal descriptions, there's many, many more parcels. We don't know how many, but so the title company was doing the research to figure out how many parcels there actually are. And so when they um, do the deed in lieu of foreclosure, those parcels will all be, um, that, that they'll have all the parcel information available. I guess. Would we be able to have an update on that by October 4th? Yeah, I mean, we'll, yeah, we'll either be able to update that it happened or it didn't happen. So okay. yes, we can totally update that. Okay. Yeah. And then um, one thing I wanted to ask, is there a, we know that Sarah's retirement is um, happening soon. Is there a succession plan in place yet? Are we able to have anything like that? Reported on in October? As far as replacing behind Sarah. So she's talked about leaving in mid December, but it's nothing that's been officially filed that I know of yet. Um, so I'll let her speak to her for sure plans. But as part of me coming is to hopefully transition and have some knowledge about the sites, but I would have to change my current workload because I have a lot of other sites. And so that's in the discussion. Would it be just me? Would there be someone else? And then what would be taken off my plate? And then we were told that Jennifer was the um, interim community involvement coordinator. <clears throat> is there plans for Jennifer to stay as that? So they were trying to hire someone in the Montana office because we have so many super right. sites. We need to have someone local. That is still in the process. And I don't know if when that person got hired, they would take over for Jennifer. And I think that's why she's saying it's interim. Um, is that maybe the Montana person would be able to come more and it's a lot easier to travel from Helena than Denver. And so she's been assigned and she uh, was on vacation for most of July, but she's back and getting more involved in stuff. So hopefully we'll see her around more, but I think ultimately they will, she will be replaced by someone local. She signed up for the tour next week. Yeah. yeah. Any other discussion or questions? If we're not running right out of the room, <laughs> I would love to circle back to John's question that, that I want to ask in more simple terms and not get deep in the discussion. But the difference between the PCB identification and an immediate dealing with it versus we see contamination, but it's got to sit for a while. I just want to understand if I were telling a classroom of high school students. Here's how this works and why one is dealt with immediately and why one is in a whole path. Yeah, I, I wasn't involved in the conversations that happened between uh, EPA and the PRPs at that point uh, or the communications uh, 
for that PCB cleanup. I, I don't have an answer for you as far as why that was allowed to be dug out and um, we're still investigating the rest of the site. Uh, it was an exceedance, uh, a, a blatant exceedance of DQ7 um, PCB uh, levels and um, I, I think that the, the concentration of the sites that we saw versus where we sampled all around the site was what triggered the, uh, it was not called an emergency cleanup. Generally for a high concentration uh, contamination, you would trigger, you know, you trigger emergency cleanup no matter what part of the RI or what part of the process you're in. And uh, I don't believe they were high enough to trigger that, but that's. Uh, I think as part of the tour, if you're stopping by one of the removal areas, we can ask Keith or Sarah to address that yeah, question. Okay, 10-4, we shall do that. Okay, thanks, Larry. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, stick around for Bruce and the Broom Study comments, Connie for health concerns. And if you have other agenda items you want to talk about, but everyone, come on over to